My life has been so outrageous and implausible that if it were a story, it would simply be bad writing. This will serve as my authorized biography and final will and testament. What you're about to read is true, to the best of my recollection. Although there is no you to read this, as I am the only you left on all of planet Earth. And I don't have a ton of time, because I have quite literally been stabbed in the back. I'll start from the top. Like all powerful people, I was born into extravagant wealth. I was raised by maids of varying nationalities, handpicked by my father to teach me languages as I grew up. By nine years old, I was fluent in Arabic, French, German, Czech, Chinese, Vietnamese, Swahili, Polish, Murphy-Ketonian, and Armenian. I was 22 years old when I met my father, Thomas Carter Murphy. Thomas Carter Murphy was one of the first politician turned celebrities. He was deeply involved behind the scenes in the Second Iran War and made a killing off war profiteering and nation building. His reach spanned from the Middle East to Eastern Asia. He created a small island nation off the coast of Japan that he called Murphy Tico. There, my father installed a strongman named Tram Othman. Generalissimo Tram was a four foot, eight inch ex bus driver who quickly rose to the position of dictator. My father arranged for a few of the United States' best and brightest scientists to be kidnapped and shipped to Murphy Tico. Among them was Egon Malkazian, whose knack for nuclear physics and biological weapons was nothing short of supernatural. He developed nuclear missiles for Murphy Tico at gunpoint in just four years. Shortly thereafter, Egon Malkazian was blown to smithereens by the U.S. Air Force in a surgical airstrike. Tram secret police found a secret tell-all manifesto in his mattress, warning NATO and Russia about my father, Generalissimo Tram's violent mental instability, and Murphy Tico's very real threat to world peace and global stability. <laughs> My father ordered the strike after pulling some strings in the Department of Defense. Allegedly, he pushed the button himself. Egon Malkazian left behind a daughter whose whereabouts became unknown. The global community was outraged at the creation of Murphy Tico and its fresh arsenal of nukes. This briefly made my father the source of much international scandal. He leveraged his charm to gain a name for himself as an unrepentant, straight-shooting, talking head on the right-wing cable news circuit. He made many powerful friends and gathered blackmail for many more powerful politicians and businessmen. One by one, he bought people out. Or rather, he extorted them. <laughs> In no time, he established Jefferson News Network. It became a platform for populist, extremist politicians and pundits. Jefferson News Network bought up each broadcast TV network and gobbled up nearly every industry traded on the stock market. My career took off at my college graduation party at the Columbia Country Club in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Ted Nugent had cornered me at the buffet. He was raving about an international socialist conspiracy between swigs of Miller Lite when I was grabbed by the shoulder. A gigantic man in a tight-fitting tuxedo glared down at me. Half his face had the saran wrap gloss of a burn scar, and his eyes were tiny black pinpricks. Come with me, Mr. Murphy, he ordered in a low baritone. Just a fucking minute, I'm talking to him, Ted Nugent shouted. In one quick movement, the man palmed Ted Nugent's face, shook it, and threw him to the ground by his head. Ted was knocked unconscious. A pool of Miller Lite seeped like blood into the hardwood floor. The giant man was named Clinton Harding Roosevelt. He served as my bodyguard until last night, when he put a Sig Sauer P226 handgun behind his ear and pulled the trigger while biting down on a glass cyanide capsule. Clinton pushed me into the parking lot where a two-lane-wide limousine idled. He dragged me to the limousine and knocked three times on the window in an odd rhythm. Three odd knocks knocked back. He opened the door and shoved me inside. Two red velvet benches ran up the interior. Small chandeliers hung from the ceiling every few feet, bathing the car in a sickly yellow glow. In the back sat a man with wild gray hair, wearing an unbuttoned smoking jacket with a sweat-stained A-frame t-shirt underneath. He wore sweatpants with grass stains on the knees and dirty, unlaced New Balance sneakers. Body odor hung in the air. It smelled like taco mix. 
A capuchin monkey sat next to him, staring into an iPhone. The monkey donned a pair of tiny cargo shorts. The man blew his nose into his palm and wiped his hand on his sweatpants. He inspected his fingers and rubbed them on his pants once again. This is an important day for me, he said in a gravelly tenor. Oh, yeah? I said. He picked at his teeth and leaned over, emitting a brassy fart. Look, man, I don't... I began. I stopped myself when the man leaned forward and furrowed his brow. He ran his hand through his hair, slicking it to the side in its natural grease. His features took a serious look. I recognized him. (gasps) Dad? I gasped. My father relaxed his face and sat back. He scratched his scrotum through his sweatpants, then sniffed his fingers before rubbing them on his thigh. He patted the monkey on the back and whispered, Murphy, privacy please. Without looking up from his iPhone, the monkey reached into its cargo shorts and pulled out a pair of headphones. It plugged them in its ears. My father exhaled a deep burp through a sigh and stared off. He blinked and held his eyes shut, then slowly nodded forward before snapping back awake. He scratched his chest. I'm kind of fucked up, he groaned. I tapped my fingers on my knees and said, No judgment here, sir. My father smirked. I like you. I like you, too, I stammered. It came out weird, and we sat in silence. I set up a job for you in television, he said. Can you act? I've never tried, sir, I said. He shrugged his shoulders. Who gives a shit? (laughs) He belched. We're going to make you just a little famous. This is all part of a larger plan, so you cannot fuck this up. Do you understand me? Easy on the drugs, easy on the drinking. Don't say any dumb shit and be a nice guy. Like Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is in prison, sir, I replied. Oh, shit, that's right, he said. He squeezed the bridge of his nose. It got quiet. Um, but yes, yeah, I can be a nice guy, sir. Good. What's the show, I asked. Who gives a shit? But it has the financial backing equivalent to Germany's GDP. Just show up and follow orders. We got you a catchphrase and everything. He leaned forward. But this is the most important thing of all. I'll be watching you, and when it's time... The deep buzz of a vibrating phone interrupted him, followed by the tinkling MIDI melody of a ringtone. He reached into his pocket and inspected it. Oh, fuck me, he sighed and answered the phone call. What is it this time, Tram? He asked. On the other end of the phone burst the muffled, piercing din of a raving man. My father pointed at the phone and rolled his eyes, then made a circle with his thumb and fingers. He rocked his wrist back and forth, suggesting the caller was a jerk-off. This was indeed a shockingly familiar gesture from a man with whom I had spent a total of seven minutes in my entire waking life. I'm not bitter. My father waved me away. The door opened and Clinton pulled me out into the parking lot. He clutched a rolling suitcase in his massive hand and held a blue suit in a plastic-wrapped dry cleaner's bag over his shoulder, hanging from his pinky finger. A new limo pulled up as my father's limo pulled away. Clinton opened the door, grabbed me by the elbow, and shoved me in. He plopped me into the car and sat too close, pushing me against the door. Our plane is waiting at Murphy International Airport in Beverly Hills, California. (laughs) Ooh, my back hurts. Focus, Tommy. I was at the rap party for the smash hit dramatic comedy Alpaca Farm after a lucrative 12-year run. Alpaca Farm followed the exploits of the Arbuckle family, who flee a blue state big city for a quiet American life on an alpaca farm. Comedic genius and tender moments abound. Our goofy but respectful 4th of July episodes enjoyed the viewership of 188 million people, followed closely by our solemn and patriotic Veterans Day extravaganza. 
Alpacas. <laughs> Goofy animals indeed. Are they camels? Are they sheep? I'm in stitches just thinking about it. I'll tell you one thing they are. One of the most profitable exports of Murphy Tico, second only to oil. Alpaca fever swept the nation for over a decade. Americans gobbled up alpaca sweaters, pants, shirts, and alpaca farm merchandise. It made my father and Tram Othman impossibly rich. Yet money was not enough for Generalissimo Othman. From day one of production to the night of the rap party, Tram Othman called Jefferson Entertainment Network, a division of Jefferson News Network, screaming like a madman, demanding a recurring guest role on the show. Every day, he would be turned down. Every so often, he'd threaten nuclear war with Japan if his demands weren't met, resulting in the UN sending Murphy Tico hundreds of millions of dollars just so he'd back down. During each international crisis, Alpaca Farm's viewership would surge by millions. I enjoyed Outrageous Celebrity, playing the goofy but lovable son, Andrew Jackson Arbuckle. My catchphrase swept the nation. Upon the conclusion of each episode, my deplorable, unforgivably liberal sister, Sunflower Obama Arbuckle, would utter one final, entitled, whiny complaint, teeing me up for my line. The audience would go silent. I'd take a deep breath and say, <laughs> Save your drama for your llama. The crowd would go nuts. Of the many terrible things I've done in my life, I am most ashamed of this catchphrase. God forgive me. It should be noted that llamas and alpacas are different animals. At the wrap party, I was sipping champagne with my future Secretary of State, Tim Allen. He played my father, the even-tempered John Adams Arbuckle. Secretary Adam was about 14 drinks deep with a sizable coke booger in his left nostril. I decided not to inform him of this, exacting a tiny revenge for his frequent, violent outbursts on set. Jefferson Entertainment Network arranged for live alpacas to wander around the party, led by short men in traditional Murphy Tico garb. The men wore giant American flag pins on their chests. The alpacas had diapers fastened to their butts, decorated with American flags. Secretary Allen was raving about an international liberal conspiracy, claiming libs were running guns and children out of Mexican restaurants across the nation. I nodded politely. Of course, they're operating out of Mexican restaurants. The libs handed this country over to them in the 20s. Just picture it. The Clintons scarfing down guacamole while child slaves. He was interrupted when an alpaca backed against him, knocking him off balance. Secretary Allen grabbed my shoulder to regain his footing, then promptly bent over and vomited on the marble floor, accented with a substantial splash. A pair of alpacas cantered over and began lapping up his barf. Tim Allen leaned forward and passed out chest first into his noxious sick. Two men in traditional Murfatico garb took him by his ankles and dragged him out of the room. I was wiping vomit off my shoe with an American flag handkerchief when something stirred within me. A warm current ran through my body. I felt at peace. I looked up from the puke. Time slowed, alpacas parted. My eyes projected spotlights on the front doors of the banquet hall. The door slowly opened. The most beautiful woman to ever wander this once great earth came in through the doorway wearing a pearl white dress. A tasteful diamond studded American flag necklace hung from her shoulder blades. I floated over to her, hypnotized. She saw me coming. She stood still, smiled, then bashfully looked at her shoes. When I finally reached her, I couldn't speak. She batted her green eyes and brushed wisps of platinum blonde hair from her forehead. She smelled like a mixture of roses and sweet summer rain. Finally, words came to me. This is a nice party, I said robotically. She laughed into her hand. It is, she said. Cocktails are good. I like how they taste. I said. I didn't move. She raised her eyebrow. Should we go to the bar? She asked. Um, I said. I, I was, I was frozen. What's on your pants? She asked. I looked down. That's barf. Tim Allen barfed on me. I said before I could think. Her face twisted. 
My heart dropped. She laughed. I laughed with her. I'm Martha Hamilton, she said. Tommy Murphy, I said, as I kissed the back of her hand. I know, she said with an odd accent. Where are you from? I asked. Hawaii, she said. Aloha, I said. I took her by the hand and we walked to the bar. The next morning, I brought her to Washington, D.C. and introduced her to my father. Uh, (sighs) Oh, Mm. yeah, it really hurts to breathe. I need one second. Ah, no whammies, no whammies, no whammies. Uh, Let's keep going. In two months, I married Martha Hamilton Murphy. In three months, we starred in our own newlywed reality show titled, And America Makes Two. Like, Alpaca Farm. It had an exclamation point in the title. I have no idea what And America Makes Two was supposed to mean. Jefferson Entertainment Network carefully edited every second of footage, meticulously manufacturing the perfect, God-fearing, patriotic, heteronormative American couple. Million-dollar checks and endorsement deals stumbled over one another, racing to my front door. And America Makes Two was a work of complete fiction. Jefferson Entertainment Network found an actor who flawlessly dubbed my voice. Words that I did not, and would never say, were put in my mouth. Backgrounds were stitched in, to make us look like we lived in an inoffensive McMansion in an affluent neighborhood in small-town USA. We shot everything on a soundstage in Studio City, California. One day on set, I was approached by the show's producer, American game show legend Chuck Woolery. He was 102 years old at the time. Chuck told me and Martha that we would be having a guest over for breakfast that morning. Who is it? I asked. Nobody. Just keep your fucking mouth shut! Chuck scowled. He spat on the ground. If you say one word, I'll break your fucking neck! How does that fucking sound, tough guy? Keep your fucking mouth shut or I'll fucking kill you! Globs of foamy white spit collected in the corners of his mouth, and he jabbed me in the sternum with an arthritic pointer finger. Not a word, Mr. Woolery, I said. He grabbed me under my armpit and dragged me to the kitchen table, where Martha was already sitting. She smiled and rolled her eyes and put a finger to her lips, giving me an exaggerated shush motion. She laughed. Chuck violently sat me down, looked around the room, then slapped me in the face. My ears rang. Look alive! He screamed. He clapped his hands twice. The kitchen door opened and two massive twins dragged in a badly beaten man. The twins wore neon muscle shirts and vinyl shorts with boat shoes. Their eyes betrayed little intelligence. The beaten man wore a green screen leotard with plastic balls attached to his unitard to capture his motion. His face was gray and bags hung under his eyes. He had makeup caked over his mouth, poorly covering a busted lip. The man had been righteously roughed up. His appearance made me feel sick. The twins jammed him into the chair across from me. One twin smacked him on the back of the head. The man hardly flinched. He was drugged. I whispered, Oh my god, are you okay? Shut the fuck up! Chuck Woolery screamed insanely offset. It went quiet. The crew positioned lights around us and turned them on. Martha gave me a desperate look, then locked a forced smile in place. Action! cried Chuck Woolery. I sat there, eyes wide, staring at the man across from us. Look happy, goddammit! Chuck shrieked. I smiled. The man slumped. Cut! Sit him up straight, goddammit! Jesus, fuck! The twins entered and roughly put the man in place like he was a doll. Action! The man lamely made eye contact with me. I uncomfortably smirked. Perfect! Like that. That's a perfect smile. Hold it for five more seconds or I'll fucking kill you, so help me God. The man blinked hard. He blinked again. He began blinking in desperate, sporadic bursts, like he was trying to tell me something. Fearful of Chuck's retribution, I pretended to not notice. Cut! That's a wrap! Get that man the fuck out of my sight! One week later, the episode premiered. It was the most viewed television episode in the history of the United States. I was mortified when I saw it. 
Jefferson Entertainment Network spent $32 million to replace the badly beaten actor with a flawless CGI rendering of, oh my God, George Washington. Post-production stitched together every frame, every angle to manufacture a scene where the father of our nation interviewed me. They dressed him up in a pair of distressed jeans, unlaced work boots, and a casual golf polo. He looked both tan and sunburned at the same time, like a Floridian. He had a farmer's tan around his eyes in the shape of wraparound sunglasses and spoke in a charming southern accent. Throughout the entire quote-unquote interview, he sipped on a can of beer in a red, white, and blue koozie. The experts in special effects used CGI on my face and Martha's face as well, matching George Washington's questions with perfectly poised responses performed by mysterious voice doubles. The interview lacked any substance whatsoever. George Washington and my voice double talked mostly about college football and how great America, quote, used to be. I needn't go into details about what we talked about. You can fill in the blanks. What's most important is what was said at the end of the interview. George Washington took one final sip of his beer and shook it from side to side. It was empty. He quietly burped. He took the beer out of the koozie, crushed it in his massive hand, and tossed it over his shoulder. It landed in a wastebasket, bouncing off the wall in a bank shot. He set the koozie on the table and twisted it around to face the camera. Murphy 2052 was written in red, white, and blue. So, he said, is it true? My CGI rendered face grinned. Is what true? My voice double said coyly. Are you really gonna run for president? He asked. You bet your ass, my artificial likeness replied. George Washington held up his fist for a bump. He wore a mason ring. I nearly vomited. A few weeks before the end of And America Makes Two's run, a mousy assistant editor pulled me aside and quietly led me into his office. He flipped on his computer and rolled the footage of the badly beaten man. He zoomed in on the man's erratic blinks. That's Morse code, he whispered. What's he saying? I asked. The man turned off the footage and looked me dead in the eye. Torture. I swallowed hard. A few years later, I found out that the assistant editor had been disappeared. (laughs) It's actually kind of funny, because a few years after that, I had Chuck Woolery tied to a post and blown to bits with an anti-aircraft missile. (laughs) C'est la vie, Chuck. Ooh, my back is bleeding into my underwear. I can feel every heartbeat. Oh, okay. I got to pick up the pace here, my fellow Americans. Let's fast forward to 2052. A gun in every nightstand and three cars in every garage. I screamed into the mic, spittle flying. The crowd at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Dayton, Ohio went bananas. I lifted my t-shirt to wipe the sweat from my forehead, exposing a curated beer belly. I then performed my signature move of ripping the sleeves off my t-shirt and holding them in the air like a professional wrestler. Put yourself first, I shouted, pumping my fists to the heavens. Put yourself first, put yourself first, chanted the crowd, grunting like apes. Behind me, motorcycles in a circular metal cage raced around each other, red, white, and blue sparks flying from the tailpipes. Fireworks exploded. The Blue Angels performed acrobatics in the sky. Martha gave me a thumbs up from the side of the stage. Tears welled in her eyes. The adoration was intoxicating. By the end of the campaign, I was a totally different person. I got a taste of international celebrity, and I was hooked. Jefferson News Network convinced America everything I said was true. All criticisms lobbied against me were a hoax. I felt loved. The first time around, I won 49 states. I lost Vermont. So my first order of business in the White House was to combine Vermont and New Hampshire. By executive order, I named the incorporated states New Washington. I directed the Secret Service to pay a personal visit to each and every Vermonter who voted against me. They never voted against me again. 
The home visits cost taxpayers $3,872,622.17. Four years later, I won all 49 states. I won them again eight years later. In 10 years, I declared myself president for life. Look, I understand this is an abrupt leap in character. Once a mild-mannered TV celebrity, which is the lowest kind of celebrity, now a despot. And I don't consider this lazy writing because it all did happen pretty fast. I think it just goes to show how absolute power corrupts absolutely. Huh. Man, uh... Maybe it's reading it all listed out like this, or maybe it's the bleeding, gaping wound in my back and the creeping certainty of my impending death. But for the first time in my life, I might be feeling guilt. Ugh, okay, I'm going to gloss over a few more things. It's not in my nature to apologize, so I won't. I was president for life. What do you think happened? Summary executions? Check. The use of my office for financial gain? Check. Re-education camps? Ooh, baby, that's a big-time check. The institution of a single-party system, abolition of voting, the dissolution of the Supreme Court, hand-picked congressmen and senators placating my every whim? Check. Check. Check, motherfucker. The details don't matter. What matters is I was famous, and being famous was enough to make me president. <laughs> okay, I know I said I'd skip, but I want to include this factoid. When the U.S. men's soccer team lost the gold medal to Spain in 2060, I had the entire team, the coach, trainers, the marketing machine behind them, even the man who designed their jerseys, welded into a school bus that I myself, on Jefferson News Network, pushed into the Delaware River on the eve of George Washington's famous crossing. <laughs> I thought of it in a dream. Um. <sighs> Oh, whoa. Okay. Oh. <sighs> Oof. I nodded off there for a sec. Blech. I'm worried I'll fall asleep and bleed out, so I'm gonna stand while I write the rest. Oof. I just took a look back at what I've written, and holy moly, I dedicated way too much space to Tim Allen puking. <laughs> oh, I thought I had more time. Ugh. Tram Oathman, you awful son of a bitch, here you go. An entire chapter dedicated to you, right at the end, too. And I'll include your sneaky surprise guest. I hope you're happy. Even though by now you are most likely dust in the wind. Ah, a smash rock and roll hit by the Americana prog rock band Kansas. Tommy, come on, man, focus. Focus, let's do this. The swift nuclear annihilation of planet Earth can be traced back to one man. Tram Othman. Well, I mean, the end of the world could more simply be traced back to my father, Thomas Carter Murphy. You know, I suppose there would be no Tram Othman, no Alpaca Farm, and no And America Makes Two, no Martha Hamilton, no Murphy Tico, no Egon Malkazian, and no... <laughs> global nuclear extermination without my father, Thomas Carter Murphy. My father could have just given Tram Othman a guest-starring role in Alpaca Farm, or at the very least a walk-on featured episode. Generalissimo Tram would have had his alpacas, his nukes, and his immunity from international law. He would have lived a happy, tiny life as a happy, tiny man on a happy, tiny island. You, my fellow American, wouldn't be a gamma ray shadow on the pavement or in your kitchen or on your vaporized recliner in your vaporized man cave. And, most importantly, I wouldn't be bleeding to death. My father, Thomas Carter Murphy, didn't blindly point at a crowd in Murphy Tico and yell, Hey! Hey you! You're president! Because, as you well know, my father, Thomas Carter Murphy, had a flair for the dramatic. After the violent takeover of Murphy Tico and the nationalization of its media outlets, he put on a show titled Murphy Tico's Brightest Star. It was an elimination-style show that pitted aspiring actors against one another to become Murphy Tico's first crossover Hollywood celebrity. 
My father worked with former CIA operatives to screen each prospective contestant and determine which one would be the most sycophantic toady. They settled on amateur actor and bus driver, Tram Oathman. My father enlisted future writers for And America Makes Two and Alpaca Farm to portray Trem Othman as a lovable but goofy heartthrob, despite his slight stature, quiet demeanor, and basset hound face. Generalissimo Tram stole Murphy Tico's hearts with a crooning rendition of Dust in the Wind by American prog rock band Kansas. Oh, duh. That's why I was thinking about it. On the series finale, Tram won a 10-year development contract with a phony talent agency and was surprised with the title of President for Life. Murphy Tikonians were ecstatic and agreed it felt good to have a common man in office. Oh, 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 Tram, we're not so different, you and I. Generalissimo Tram's talent development contract fizzled over the following 10 years. My father directed the Murphy Tico post office to intercept and destroy audition tapes that Tram mailed daily to Hollywood, California. My father had Tram right where he wanted him, keeping him angry and unpredictable. Tram's insane rants distracted international news and the UN from the sneaky seeds my father was planting for the total overthrow of the United States of America. When the international community stopped taking Tram Othman seriously, my father kidnapped Egon Malkazy and his wife and his daughter and gave Tram nukes. I later learned Tram Othman had Egon Malkazian's wife killed. I just recently learned that Generalissimo Tram abducted Egon's daughter and locked her away in the mountains of Murphy Tico. There, she was privately tutored and trained in deep cover espionage tactics by highly skilled former Mossad agents. Yesterday evening, I was napping in the Oval Office when my wife, Martha Hamilton Murphy, gently woke me up and turned on the TV. I looked at my watch and saw it was 7.56 p.m. In a few minutes, my father was to appear on Secretary of Defense Sean Hannity's television program on the Jefferson News Network. He was invited to discuss Trem Othman's escalating threats against the United States. The previous week, Generalissimo Tram appeared at The Hague and promised total nuclear annihilation of planet Earth if Alpaca Farm wasn't brought back for a revamp starring Tram Othman. The international community had been calling my phone off the hook, begging me to bring back the show just to calm them down. Instead, I went on Jefferson News Network and said, Crazy Tram! Why don't you save your drama for your llama? This further escalated the situation, and the EU accused me of being glib in the face of global destruction. I was not about to tarnish the legacy of Alpaca Farm. Sure, it had script issues here and there, not to mention giant, unexpected leaps in character development, not unlike this text in front of you. But Alpaca Farm was my baby. It was my first love. Tram wasn't going to take that away from me. The blood-red logo of Sean Hannity's show burst on the TV screen. The camera focused tightly on his square face. The studio lights reflected off the glossy, plastic surgery sheen of his nose and artificial cheekbones. His vapid, black marble eyes stared into the camera, squinting to match a threatening sneer. Tonight, I'm honored to welcome the father of the father of our nation to the program, Thomas Carter Murphy, he growled. My father's buxom 19-year-old Russian wife, Nadenka, wheeled him into frame. Tubes sprawled out of the back of his wheelchair, plugging into his nose and ears. He wore an oxygen mask, and a giant cigar burned between his fingers. Nadenka gave him a wet kiss on his cheek, and he waved her away. Mr. Murphy, let's address this head-on. What's America gonna do about crazy tram? Sean Hannity barked. I've been advising my son personally. And the bottom line is, America won't negotiate with terrorists, my father rasped. I rolled my eyes and tipped my chair back when the inside of my desk vibrated, followed by the tinkling MIDI melody of a cell phone ringtone. My personal cell phone was on my desk, and it was silent. The noise was coming from inside the drawer. I gave Martha a confused look and opened my desk. Inside, an old iPhone was buzzing. I had never seen it before. On the screen, the contact said, 
brightest star generalissimo tram Othman, above a blocked number. I picked up the phone and showed it to Martha. Her cheeks went red and she shrugged. I answered the call. Hello? Hello, most despicable President Murphy. It's your dear friend, Crazy Tram, the voice on the other end said. He had a strange accent, almost Hawaiian. I'm an old friend of your father's, despicable President Murphy. Your father made a promise to me, a promise he did not keep. My face blanched. Uh, how did you get this phone in my desk? Oh, most despicable President Murphy. I have friends all over. It's sad I can't count you among them. I put my hand over the receiver and mouthed to Martha, It's really him! My heart leapt in my throat. Martha got up and began pacing around the room. Okay, this is a prank. Ha ha, very funny. I'm hanging up now. Not so fast, most despicable President Murphy. I see you are watching most loathsome Mr. Hannity at the moment. Please, fix your attention to the screen and watch. I looked at the TV. Crazy trams about as harmful as a housefly, my father wheezed. And like a housefly, he eats shit all day. That son of a bitch doesn't know what... My father was cut off by a blinding ray of light and a sharp crash before the screen went black. After a few moments, technical difficulties and Jefferson News Network's patented red font took over the screen. Most despicable President Murphy. It didn't have to come to this. I held my phone, frozen in place. My bodyguard, Clinton Harding Roosevelt, burst into the room and slammed the door behind him. He ripped a portrait of George Washington off the wall, revealing a keypad recessed in the drywall. He entered a passcode, and blast doors rose up over the Oval Office windows. The room was enveloped in a dark red light, and a symphony of loud clangs echoed through the room as it was transformed into a bunker. The TV cut from the technical difficulty screen and went over to footage of a mushroom cloud swooshing high into the sky. Several missiles fell from the heavens and exploded in the air, showering a green cloud over the destruction. New York City crawled across the screen in red fonts. It's been an honor, sir. Clinton's deep voice boomed behind me. I turned around as he took a capsule from his front pocket and put it between his teeth. He unholstered his Sig Sauer P226 handgun, put it behind his ear, and pulled the trigger as he bit down on a cyanide pill. Chunky, hot gore splattered on my face. I screamed and desperately looked to Martha. She sighed and flashed me a slight smile. She put her hands in her front pockets and began whistling as she paced around the room. The TV cut to a new screen. Several mushroom clouds billowed into the air, followed by several more missiles exploding in the sky, pouring down green gas. Los Angeles crawled across the bottom of the screen. Most despicable President Murphy, Tram cut in. My satellites here show a handful of missiles heading my way from the odious state of Colorado. I have made my peace with the gods, and I embrace this most glorious end. I know I have little time. Martha's hands rested on my shoulders from behind. She gently massaged the back of my neck. Now it is time for you to save your drama for your llama, most despicable President Murphy. Please tell Miss Malkazian, Uncle Tram is very proud. When the sun sets on the ma- The phone went dead. Martha leaned forward and whispered in my ear, Thomas Fitzgerald Murphy, I present you with a gift from my father, Egon Malkazian. The iPhone fell from my hand as white hot piercing pain exploded in my back. The serrated tip of a knife poked out of my shirt through the front of my chest. I screamed as she pulled it out. I leaned forward and vomited on my desk. A half-digested Big Mac mixed with bile and blood pooled in front of me. Martha slowly walked around the front of my desk, whistling. She pointed the knife at me. Sic semper tyrannis, Martha Hamilton Murphy Malkazian shouted. She turned the knife on herself and jabbed it into her carotid artery, then quickly pulled it out. A spurt of blood sprayed against a bust of Abraham Lincoln. 
Martha Hamilton Murphy Malkazian fell to the carpet, twitching as she bled out. I was all alone. I wept. Ugh. Damn. That's gonna have to do it. If you're reading this, there's an external hard drive in my desk with all 12 seasons of Alpaca Farm with commentary from me and Tim Allen, and I'm very proud of it. Ugh. There's also a folder with every episode of In America Makes Two, but that's sad for me to think about at the moment. I really did love Martha. Ugh. Well. <sighs> at least I was on TV. This is